A warm welcome and thank you for joining Sporty's webinar presentation tonight on Garmin Weather Radar Fundamentals. My name is Eric Radke representing the Sporty's Pilot Shop team and I'll be your facilitator for the evening. Big thank you to Sporty's Pilot Shop for its sponsorship of the webinar series where we tackle everything from pilot proficiency to technology and uh, sometimes get really product focused and, and tonight we kind of have a mix of that. Uh, with our Garmin weather radar topic. Also a big thank you for the Garmin aviation training team who's leading tonight's presentations. Uh, out front you will hear from Paul Yeomans who will be our kind of speaker for this evening but supporting Paul behind the scenes also from Garmin aviation training is Brian Benj and Gabe Parkinson and what those gentlemen will be doing somewhat behind the scenes is answering any questions uh, that you may wish to submit throughout tonight's presentation and you can do that via the GoToWebinar software. While we're on that topic, I'll also mention that tonight's presentation is recorded as are all of our webinar presentations. So if you have to step away or miss an important point, not to worry, you'll be able to come back and view the presentation and listen to the presentation as often as you'd like in our webinar archive at sporties.com slash webinars and it will also be available uh, via Sporties YouTube channel. Uh, so with that, Garmin Aviation, a, a company and organization that needs no introduction, a, a giant in the industry, um, a great consistent rich history of bringing us products that make us safer, that makes us more capable of pilots, but like any technology we need to know when and how to deploy the technology and those strategies um, uh, for, for getting the most value. Uh, and, and so with that, we're going to tackle the topic of airborne weather radar, and I'm very pleased to welcome on uh, Mr. Paul Yeomans. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Eric. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate when uh, our clients, our customers, our you know people we're sharing the sky with take the step to uh, safer operation of the equipment and getting to know it at, at a better level. So. Uh, just a couple things to start off. Uh, we do have Gabe and Brian here answering questions. Uh, at the end of the webinar, it will shut down the ability for us to see those questions. So we do have an email, aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com, and that will be at the bottom of almost every single slide. So if you think of a question uh, and, and you either don't submit it on the GoToWebinar software or we run out of time to answer it, please send that to aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com. And if you want to even note the, the slide number that, that it's attached to, that'll help us answer the question even faster. All right, so our course today is about a two to three hour course that we have pared down for this 50 to 60 minute webinar to give you a taste of all of the uh, radar principles that we like to teach and employ with our Garmin GWX series weather radar. Uh, so some of this is going to seem like it's going a, a little fast. I'm going to try to point out the most important um, parts of each slide, and you'll have the opportunity to go back through if you want to learn more in depth on it. Go through it at your own pace on uh, YouTube or sporties.com, uh, and feel free to reach out for uh, more questions with us. We're going to start out with basic radar principles, go into the ground-based weather radar, onto the airborne weather radar, and do a little bit of comparison there. One of our number one issues that we have with radar operators is that they want it to look more and more like NEXRAD, where in reality it won't and cannot look uh, exactly the same. Uh, after that, we'll go into the Garmin GWX weather radar systems and then weather threat management and then a little quiz at the end, uh, can, and you'll be able to see pictures of radar and then we'll give you the answers to see how well you retain the information and are you picking the storms out of the display. So if you were to take anything out of this very short uh, overview of the uh, weather radar, I would say importance of practicing in VMC conditions. Don't wait until you need it. Uh, that's one of our biggest struggles, uh, again, is not using it. So if you never use it until you're in the weather, how will you know the difference between ground clutter and actual targets or cities or water or whatever it is that you're trying to see? Uh, tilt management techniques, so it's an underutilized skill. In fact, unless you have an automatic radar, it's doing all of it for you. Uh, very similarly to what the GWX-80 does, tilt management is essential. Uh, after that, the next rad and airborne radar, radar comparison that I already touched on, and radar image interpretation techniques. 
uh, it's a skill. It's not just uh, you know learning some facts. It is a skill that we need to practice. So some terminology, uh, so radio detection and ranging. So what we're doing there is sending the signal out. It is bouncing off an object, uh, some reflectivity, and it's coming back. So this object out here that my laser is pointing at, it's hitting it and returning it. So a couple things there. Uh, if there were to be something in between there to prevent you from actually getting to the target that you're trying to paint, that would cause some interference. It might be attenuation or a decrease in sensitivity. So we're gonna talk now about certified beam width uh, and compare that to the additional beam width. Uh, so whenever a manufacturer publishes the beam width, uh, so for example, a 12 inch antenna has an eight degree beam width, that is containing about 90% of that radar's energy. However, there is still an additional 10% of that radar energy going out and being returned once it bounces off some object of reflectivity. The additional beam energy is what we're going to call that rest of uh, the energy that's being sent out and returned. That is, there is a guarantee that that outside that published beam width, it is going to be underrepresented of the true intensity of those hazards. Those hazards can be weather, weather uh, it could be ground, it could be anything that is bouncing that signal back. We're going to see a lot of examples of that throughout this presentation. All right, attenuation, uh, so that reduction or loss of radar signal energy caused by external factors. Okay, this could be scattering, could be being absorbed by the storm, uh, and with the shorter wavelengths, it is attenuating more rapidly in comparison to the radar facilities used for, say, an XRAD. Uh, bands, this is on there merely to show that there are different bands for different sources uh, or different types of radar ground base versus airborne weather. The S band is more of the next red, while the X band is more of the uh, airborne weather radar using shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies. Okay, throughout the presentation, we'll talk about strategic weather avoidance and tactical weather avoidance. As you can see, uh, the first several of these are all pre-flight planning techniques here. Okay, we're looking at the convective outlooks, the TAFs, the pilot, pilot reports, uh, and then we also have the airborne weather radar that's uh, for long range settings. So we range out, we look at the long range, and then we would come back in, but that would be used for your strategic weather avoidance. And then next round, things like that. Tactical weather avoidance is that real time identification and avoidance of those storms, generally between 60 and 120 nautical miles. And it could be definitely closer than that if you are in fact closer to the storm. So radar beam is very similar to the shape of a, of a flashlight. Okay, you have a, the center of the beam is higher reflective, all right? It is going bouncing off the uh, the wall or the floor, or whatever you're, you are pointing that flashlight at. The center of, the, of that beam is going to show you more illuminated area. The, the same is true with a radar beam and that the center of the beam is going to show you a higher reflective um, picture back on your display. To illustrate that a little bit more and to paint the picture of certified beam width compared to the additional beam width, the part right here highlighted by the red bars is gonna be more of that 90%, that certified beam width. And then outside of that, you can see that it's quite a bit less uh, uh, being reflected back. Okay, we are still getting some returns, but it is not 100% as it was inside that certified beam width. So certified beam width based on the antenna size. So next rad facilities are 28 feet or larger, uh, and they are a 0.93 degree beam width, highly focused. Uh, compared to the airborne weather radar X-band, uh, generally between 10 and 18 inches. And as you increase the antenna size, the beam width does decrease and focus more. Antenna beam pattern. So on any or most uh, radar that uh, we have here, the center of the beam right here is the most energy that's being sent out and therefore the most energy is going to be returned once it uh, bounces off an object and comes back. Uh, the certified beam width right here is in the main lobe and then on the outside of that main lobe, that's that additional energy where we're still getting some back, uh, but not as uh, reflective as in the inside. It's going to be underrepresented. 
All right, so sensitivity, the ability to the farther out you go, uh, still have that same picture or be able to paint that picture the farther out that signal is being sent. So ground-based radar, it's very high power, it's 750,000 watts. Uh, it's going to be able to penetrate and be sensitive to the weather display farther out away from the facility. Airborne weather radar, uh, a lot lower. We're using a, a solid state pulse compression radar, which is using a 40 watt. And, and that is compared to our previous system of 6,000 6, watt magnetron, able to pick up the same amount. All right, precipitation reflectivity. Uh, the most wet objects are going to be able to send back that signal better. The drier, the more difficult. So right there, we can see the dry hail right there. Very significant hazard. It's not going to be picked up as much on uh, your radar display as, say, wet snow, rain, wet hail. Okay, attenuation. We mentioned that a couple times. The ability to uh, or the, the signal to be scattered or absorbed and not be able to paint the picture behind a storm cell or mountain or something like that. So the attenuated area right there behind that large cell, that is a shadow. So the, the signal cannot pass through it enough to paint the uh, weather behind it. And so that is a shadow. Shadows are extremely dangerous, but they can also be extremely beneficial in helping us know what is a cell versus what is a city. Uh, behind cities oftentimes are still being painted but behind a severe uh, cell a you know a cell of weather uh, is going to often have a shadow and now it's a good indication so those are some of the basics and fundamentals uh, now on to the ground-based weather radar for a little um, comparison so next rad the uh, next generation radar we've talked a little bit about it a higher power transmitters 28 foot antennas in comparison to the onboard weather radar. Now they have an automatic scanning program where it's taking multiple uh, scans at multiple angles and they're giving you that composite imagery. At 10,000 feet, this is the approximate next rag coverage over the United States, 10,000 AGL. So we can see over here in the uh, mountainous areas that it just can't paint through the mountains. So there's going to be quite a bit more um, lack of coverage of that next rad. How is that going to look on a Garmin display? Well, it's either going to be that gray or purplish color. Maybe a lot of you have seen that before. There's nothing wrong with the screen or database or anything like that. That is simply there's no... Uh, next rad coverage area for that uh, particular where you're at in the map. So if, you, if you're seeing it all over the place or maybe you're flying outside of the United States for the first time, all you have to do is turn that next rad off for that uh, time period. In addition with the next rad, there is a data processing and transmission time. So it's sent to that third party company to put it into an aviation format, then beamed up to either satellites or through ADSB. But there is a six to 20 minute delay in addition to whatever uh, number age is listed on your screen. Uh, it's mosaic, so it's stitching together multiple radar sites, whereas airborne weather radar, it's just in front of us or wherever we are uh, pointing the beam at. So again, with the composite imagery, it's showing us the highest uh, reflectivity over the entire column of air. So it could be stratus rain that's low and below us and not even a factor for us, or it could be high and a towering cumulonimbus causing severe thunderstorms. All right, I love this slide because it proves the point that NEXRAD is not the same as our airborne weather radar. So decibels, uh, which is what is uh, being measured on the return of the weather, uh, so right here, for example, I have 30 decibels. So 30 decibels for an internet radar is kind of their darkest green, a little bit darker than the, the uh, FISB color. Uh, but compared to XM, that's actually a yellow. And if we come down here and compare it to our airborne weather radar of our GWX70, it's actually a different color as well. Uh, so even, even NEXRAD is different than NEXRAD, depending on where you're getting it from. So there is not a great comparison to try to make NEXRAD look like, or make airborne weather radar look like our NEXRAD. So it's a question I always ask uh, students in the class, if I see 16 minutes at the top corner, 
what does that mean for me? How old is that weather? How long ago did it happen? Well, I guarantee it's longer than 16 minutes because that's when we got it. So that was a little bit about that ground-based radar. Excellent tool for strategic weather avoidance. Excellent tool for comparing to airborne weather radar. Very complimenting, but not necessarily a replacement. And it's not used for tactical weather avoidance. Tactical weather avoidance, we're going to go to our airborne weather radar. So it is that X-band typically located in the nose or on the wing. So the difference from that ground base, uh, we it's the tactical weather avoidance. It can be employed for the strategic weather avoidance, but the pilot is going to need to control that range selection and tilt management. Uh, gain adjustment is on there. There's a possibility for the pilot to adjust. Uh, it's more of an advanced feature, which we're not going to cover in this class, but focusing on tilt management and range selection. Pointing down is going to produce ground clutter, and ground clutter is not, we should not be afraid of that. It's actually our friend. It's a datum. It's a place for a reference for us to understand what we're actually painting. So what we're looking right here, the need to manage tilt. On the left side, we have tilted too high up, and we are not getting enough returns to be able to depict or determine what we're looking at. The picture on the right there, that is pointed far too low. We are essentially painting all ground clutter and not really sure if we're painting weather or not. The only indication that it would be weather is if I was to start to see a shadow somewhere out there behind some of those darker um, returns, but I don't, so I'm just not sure. All right, so here we have an example of something that could look quite scary, and this is all about tilt management. So at the very beginning, I see my ground clutter line. That's where my um, additional beam energy is starting to hit. The certified beam energy is going to start hitting at the out there when I'm starting to get those stronger returns. But if I see that large magenta uh, target right out in front of me, well, I definitely don't want to fly into it. But that is a good key because I don't want to fly into the ground, which is exactly what I'm painting in this particular scenario. On the right-hand side, on the upper side, it is going to be the certified beam width, and you can see uh, right there in the middle, I am passing uh, the certified beam energy and hitting the ground. The red bar is the ground. On the bottom here, that is the additional beam energy, so the beginning of the ground clutter should be right about there, and it is matching up just past that 20-mile mark. Now I've tilted up one degree, so I've gone from negative three degrees up to negative two degrees, and I can see everything's starting to shift out. I'm rolling away. I can see my certified beam width has started to move away and away. Now I'm up to negative one and that large scary magenta target out in front of us has started to dissipate, telling me more and more that it wasn't a storm cell. Since I am painting from the ground up, I should be able to paint a cell, a weather cell, if that was the case. Continuing to go up, it's just barely touching the ground on the uh, certified beam width. Beam width is, uh, the certified beam width is, is completely off the ground, uh, assuming a flat ground here. Up to two degrees. And now my additional beam energy where I'm getting those light, lighter green returns. That is an um, underrepresentation of the ground because the ground is, of course, a significant hazard. And now we're up to that three degrees where it's just barely touching the ground. So that was all ground clutter. That was, in fact, a large city that we were painting. So now we have a little bit of understanding, hey, that, that large magenta cell or that large magenta you know, possible target didn't have a shadow. And we were able to use tilt management to rule out that it was a cell, that it was not a cell. All right, so let's explore a storm cell real quick. Uh, the very top of that storm, there's typically that turbulence bow wave or we don't really want to fly over it because of uh, the turbulence and um, potential hail that's being thrown out the top. We're not going to be painting anything up there. Then we have that area of negative 20 and up, so negative 20 and colder. That is minimum reflectivity. Things are typically starting to get a little too frozen for us to be able to get a lot of reflectivity back and being able to paint it. Okay, below that negative 20 degree line, so zero to negative 20, that's moderate reflectivity. The things are moist enough, wet enough for us to be able to get some pretty good returns, not necessarily optimal. When we are pointed the beam at or below that zero degree line, that's where we're getting that maximum reflectivity. Uh, we want to be able to point the beam at the uh, melting level. 
so typically for the summer, it's about 14,000 feet MSL and standard atmospheric freezing level is 7,500. Now we need to be able to point part of that, that certified beam width uh, at that melting level. And that's gonna be able to get us the, the strongest returns, our best returns to be able to depict it. So possible thunderstorm re returns that we're gonna get there. Uh, right here, we have a very steep gradient, uh, kind of like your atmospheric lapse rate. Stuff starts changing fast. That means it's moving fast. It's gonna be turbulent. Uh, it could be irregular rainfall and very strong turbulence. Over here with the hook fingers and scalloped edges, um, very similar in the fact that it could be turbulent, could also be a tornadic activity. And then everyone's familiar with what a squall line is. Uh, we always have to say, you know, don't attempt to penetrate that squall line. Even though you have that airborne weather radar and you can see uh, it, there's nothing behind it, but be cautioned, that could be a shadow or what we're about to talk about, the blind alley. Uh, so the blind alley is all about range management. Uh, right now, when I have it zoomed in to 40 or 60 miles, uh, you know, it looks like I could possibly just fly straight through that one and, and on my way. I don't have to change course. However, I'm going to use my range management. I'm not staying stagnant. I'm going to go ahead and range out and find an even bigger cell uh, that could be potentially uh, harmful to me. I might not have enough time to make that turn after I have crossed that first line of cells. Stratus rain can be particularly difficult to paint with airborne weather radar. It's a lot lower intensity typically, or NEXRAD with that higher power, higher um, or a lower beam width can, can paint that and be able to display it. So on the left side, we have that NEXRAD imagery. Great tool, uh, and we're gonna use it with our airborne weather radar. It's showing that composite image. So we don't know exactly what altitude it's at. On our right side, we can see that we're not really painting a lot of that. We've tilted it up to try to get uh, uh, away from that ground clutter. Um, and so we're getting a little bit of returns, but not a lot. So target range versus target resolution. Uh, this is about smearing. So this target out here that we see is smeared. It's elongated out there. So there is just as many receptors, if you will, for us to be able to pick up that information at the antenna as, as you would imagine, as it would be for the signal being sent all the way out to the edge. So essentially kind of like pixels, we just don't have the ability to paint that exactly the farther out. So just lower resolution the farther out you go. So avoiding storms, you know, just as the FAA says, at least 20 miles on the upwind and on the downwind, at least 20 miles plus the speed of the cell movement. I never recommend an overflight of the thunderstorms, uh, numerous hazards that could be there. Okay, there's somewhat of a counterculture going on that the earth is flat, but I guarantee you it is round. And uh, so we need to take that into account whenever we're doing any sort of radar use beyond that about 60 to 80 miles. Uh, you start getting ground uh, drop off, roll off beyond that, and we need to take that into account. So for the, those that like the math side, we can do just a little bit of math and we're gonna use the 110, 1000 rule. So for every one degree of tilt uh, at 1000 feet of altitude at 10 miles. So if I am looking at something 80 miles away and I wanna change my, um, you know, beam to go down uh, 8,000 feet, well, that's gonna be only one degree. So 80 miles divided by that uh, 10 is gonna give me 8,000. All right, here's an example for that. We have that uh, radar beam uh, tilt geometry where at 25,000 feet, we can see the ground intercept certified beam width uh, right there at about 60 miles. We can see the start of the ground clutter with the additional beam energy. So some rough numbers for you. If you're at 30,000 AGL, uh, your approximate uh, ground clutter is gonna be at 36 miles when you have a zero degree tilt. If you're at 20,000, uh, approximately 25 miles away, you start your tilt and 10,000 at 12 miles. All right, so some range selections for short, mid and long range. Um, whenever we are uh, short range, okay, we're, we're departing or we're coming back into the airport terminal environment, you, typically about 10 to 60 mile range selection, and this is used for that tactical weather avoidance. Typically, we're at lower altitudes. So we want that tilt to be up. We don't want to be pointing it down into the ground. Our threat 
from thunderstorms is definitely coming from up. So we want to have that tilt up. So our range selection for the mid-range, uh, we typically recommend about 20 minutes of response time from that first appearance on the screen. So we have, uh, if you're going about 250 knots and 4.2 nautical miles per minute times that 20 minutes, that's going to give us about 84 miles. So if your typical range selection for cruise flight might be at that 80 mile mark. Compared to the 300 knots, five miles a minute times 20 is at 100. So we can see that for those speeds, 250 to 350, you might set your cruise flight at a typical range selection of 80 to 120. Now, just as we've said with tilt and range, it's not something that we just keep there. It's something that we're going to continue to explore. So we change our tilt to see what's going on. We change our range to see what's going on. So long range, anything beyond 160 is definitely going to be considered long range, and that is a temporary setting. So whenever we're investigating our tactical weather avoidance, and we want to also go look out ahead of the aircraft and find out what's there, range out, go see if we can see anything uh, beyond that. It is going to have to be a lower tilt because of that ground roll off, the curvature of the earth. But go find out, as we have seen on this, this picture right here, we have some returns over there. Uh, definitely going to be something that we want to pay attention to. Uh, we can see the outer ground line right there, meaning uh, the ground roll off has started to occur. So anything out here is something to be uh, aware of and going to keep an eye on. So strategic weather avoidance, aim for the freezing level at the range at the range desired. Adjust that tilt to maximize the returns. All right, ground clutter. This is kind of a hot topic these days. A lot of people are scared of ground clutter. They don't want to see it. They want to remove it from the screen. Uh, we get a lot of questions. How can I get rid of all my ground clutter? Well, we do have a tool called ground clutter suppression, but that's what that is. It's suppression, not elimination. I like to fly with ground clutter suppression off and then use it on and off. I toggle it on and off to be able to confirm what I'm looking at. So it's going to, the ground clutter itself is going to differ based on our cruise altitude range setting, our surface attributes, you know, are we over mountains, are we over water, those sorts of things. So I took this, uh, these photos coming back uh, from Chanhassen down to Olathe. We're about 28,000 feet. Uh, range was set to 80 miles and I'm going to start low. So that's my technique is to typically start low on the tilt and work it up until I can reduce the ground clutter. So I'm slowly rolling it up half a degree at a time. I see the change. I can see some ground clutter is starting to uh, dissipate. Tilt up another half a degree and I can see my ground clutter is uh, almost at the spot that I want. I'm going to tilt it up just a little bit more. Right in between there is kind of where I would leave it uh, for that area of the flight. It's kind of reducing the ground clutter so that way if anything starts appearing in there, I know it's something that would cause investigation. Here I've ranged out a little bit and now I can see I have my inner ground return line. So anything that's walking up from that, so as I fly, if this cell were to continue out towards it and it's showing in front of that inner ground clutter line, I know that's something to be concerned with and it's potentially weather that I need to avoid. Uh, now we have the outer ground line. So it's somewhere around here and it's you can see some stuff popping up beyond that. that those might be cities which are higher reflectivity, but that could just be our uh, could be cells or just our outer ground line. Ground clutter is dissipating. So if I have these things out here at the edge, that's something to note. Uh, it's a little far out there, so I might not think it's a city. I might consider that more of a cell until I get a little closer. Something to keep our eye on. Once you get beyond 160 nautical miles that uh, on your range selection, uh, you're typically going to have that ground clutter on the inner third. This is also uh, has to do with your altitude. So if you're really low altitude, it's going to probably be a little bit less than 160 whenever you start seeing ground returns only on the inner third compared to uh, the higher altitudes. All right, so right here we have what turned out to be a city. So it's just a little higher reflectivity, and out here we have that uh, that cell. Definitely something to be uh, aware of. All right, so ground clutter suppression in this picture is off, and now I'm going to turn it on. And we can see it removed quite a bit of ground clutter, not everything. I will tell you that in comparison to Nextrad, this did correlate to a line of small cells. 
Uh, it was stratus rain for the most part, and so it wasn't picking up a whole lot. But notice all these, these spots out here. This was, in fact, ground clutter. So ground clutter suppression is a great tool to be able to eliminate a lot of that, but it is not ground clutter elimination. It does not turn off ground clutter. Ground, having ground clutter actually tells me that my radar is working. I have that reference point for where the edge of the beam is pointing at, and I know it's working. So some key takeaways here, uh, the airborne weather radar is never going to appear the same as next red returns. We have to manage our range and tilt uh, to be able to get uh, clear pictures that are going to help us avoid those storms. All right, so that was airborne weather radar. We're gonna talk about some of the features of the GWX 70, 75, and 80, and how are we using those features to do all the things we just talked about uh, with airborne weather radar. So we'll start with GWX-70, the solid state X-band pulse compression radar system. Has these number of features there with the sector scanning, vertical scan, it has the weather attenuated color highlight, which we're going to talk about here in a second with target, walk, target alert, um, altitude compensate and tilt, and then that optional ground clutter suppression and turbulence detection. So the pulse compression, uh, short pulses increase range resolution, but decrease average power. So what our engineers did there was uh, compress those pulses, and now it increases that average power and resolution. So some of you who have flown other radars or maybe older magnetron radars have the issue where uh, as you see something painted farther out, you know, a, a longer range, as it gets closer, it appears to be getting stronger and stronger, where in reality, it's just the sensitivity is increasing. So because we have that digital radar, uh, we have the ability to put an algorithm in there and uh, make those images farther away, seem a little bit more intense, and that's an extended sensitivity time constant. So we're able to show what the image actually looks like, even though it's farther out and we don't have enough uh, as much true sensitivity. Antenna stabilization, all of our uh, GWX 70, 75, and 80 all have the uh, antenna stabilization, and that's essentially to prevent the actual antenna bouncing around and damaging the servos there. So we're going to engage the servos uh, to prevent that jostling whenever we're flying. Uh, if your system does not automatically turn it into to standby, we recommend on startup, you go ahead and put your radar into standby to energize those servos and prevent further damage. Uh, so one feature, automatic frequency shifting. Uh, this typically only happens when you have other radar users in the area and they're operating on the exact same frequency. So and the system automatically shifts to a different frequency. So the picture on the first one right here on the left, that was um, before it sensed that there was another radar with the same frequency and then it automatically shifted uh, to a different frequency to compensate for that. So if you see that, don't worry, just wait for another uh, pass there with the radar and see if it takes care of it. Horizontal scan mode, uh, so the most common feature of any airborne weather radar that there is. We do have the range selection out to 320 miles and sector scans to be able to isolate a particular part and get faster returns. So there's the example. It's the same example that we were talking about with the shadow behind that cell uh, that was attenuated. Okay, we have vertical scan mode. And uh, this is a dramatized uh, picture right there. And it's actually only out to 20 miles. Uh, a lot of times vertical scan mode can be very difficult to estimate those tops. So we don't really try to estimate those tops for the purpose of flying over them. Uh, it just gives us kind of an idea in comparison to other returns. Notice also that there are returns all the way along that ground return, uh, all the way along that line, all the way out. There's nothing wrong with your radar that vertical mode is scanning from the top to the bottom, so you guaranteed will have ground return unless you're flying over calm water. So there's that example. We have the ground returns all the way out, and we can see some peaks starting to form out there, and the ranges do correlate with the cell. Altitude compensated tilt uh, is used only during climb. You would definitely want to turn it uh, off during cruise flight, and that's going to capture 75% of the range that you have selected. So, for example, if you have 80 miles set, 
It's going to capture the tilt angle required as you climb or descend to keep you pointed at whatever was at 75%. In this case, it would be 60. I don't typically use this. I just manage my tilt as I'm climbing. All right, this feature is very nice, the uh, weather attenuated color highlight. And that is just that uh, shaded area beyond some of those cells to point you in the direction, hey, this might be a shadow, very uh, dangerous area. We don't know what's behind there. Too much of the signal has been attenuated. Target alert bands, so this red bar out there, telling us that there is something either within that 40 or even beyond that 40 miles in this particular case. So the signal is being sent out to whenever it, it uh, loses all of its energy and returning anything that it sees in there. So even though our range is set to 40 miles, the signal is still being sent beyond that. So out here we have that on the left side, we have the red bar right there. It tells me there still could be a threat even though there's no, no returns visible on the map. We have weather alert. Uh, which is anything within 10 degrees of the center line can give you that alert. That's actually a system message that would come up. All right, ground mapping mode. Ground mapping mode is very similar to uh, normal mapping. It's a different color scheme. The reason I like this picture right here is that it paints this uh, the city and the lake right there beautifully. Uh, so right in front of us, we would have um, that lake. It's skipping right off of it. So because it's a flat surface, just like a mirror, it's hitting the water and bouncing off of it. And then it's painting that city uh, just beyond that. All right, turbulence detection. I will say that the color scheme for 70 compared to the 75 and 80 is different. Uh, the, the GWX 70 is using magenta for turbulence. And we'll take note of that in comparison to the 75 and 80. Here's that ground clutter suppression on and off. Uh, it is optional for the 70, and it's using Doppler um, technology inside 40 miles, and it's using an averaging uh, technique beyond 40 miles. So when you're within 40 miles, it's a lot more reliable, still not going to use it as a, a fail safe, but it is a, a very helpful tool, especially within 40 miles. Here's the color scheme, depending on the decibel return of the cell that we're painting or whatever target that we are actually painting. So green through red for the typical returns with magenta being turbulence. All right, gain settings, as we mentioned, is more of an advanced feature uh, used to adjust the displayed image um, and analyze those returns. Kind of, kind of the point to see how close to red is that yellow? Do I really want to dance with that? Well, if I'm seeing a red, I'm not gonna fly near it uh, for the most part. Uh, I'm gonna stay away from it. It's more of an advanced feature. We're not really gonna cover it during this webinar. All right, so the GWX 75, uh, one of the newer series that we have here, it's gonna include all those features from the GWX 70. And in, in addition, it has a multi-core processor, much faster advanced waveform technology, the color palette takes away any need for you to use that gain adjustment, and it's a faster returns. Here's that enhanced color palette, so 16 color palettes, using magenta now for those stronger returns instead of using uh, turbulence. And now on the GDBX 70 and sorry, 75 and 80 is white. So every two decibels is a different color. No need for me to use that gain adjustment. We have differentiated target alert bands, so Based on the uh, return that I would be getting, if it was going to be, be magenta, I would see that actual magenta color out there, and I can see all the different colors on the uh, target alert band there. So there's that turbulence detection. We can see white in there. If I am seeing on my GWX 75 or 80, if I'm seeing magenta, I can guarantee you there's going to be turbulence in there. All right, we have enhanced ground clutter suppression. So the technologies have just gotten better and we've employed that with the 75 and 80. Now, please note that these were Photoshopped images to illustrate uh, ground clutter suppression. We are constantly working on getting better and better images, uh, which we will put in these presentations at a later date. But that is not a, a true representation of, of that ground clutter suppression. So GWX 80 includes all those features of 75. 
the major advancement here is the automatic mode. Uh, so similarly to the next red where it's taking multiple scans and giving you that composite image, we are taking those scans and giving you a, a, a composite image and reducing a whole lot of that ground clutter, much better than uh, what we've used with the 75 or 70. Uh, ground clutter suppression would come on automatically whenever you use uh, the volumetric auto mode. It does have uh, predictive lightning and hail regions, which you'll see a brief picture for that. There's the controls if you're using a G3000 or 5000. Most of our recommendation is put it into auto mode and leave it there unless you're wanting to investigate a very particular spot. Another illustration for the automatic mode, so taking multiple scans. Uh, so in this case, the tilt angle is right there, but it's taking the scan from up here and below and giving you that composite image to identify that threat. With the GWX80, uh, we do have a zero blind range or something like a zero blind range. On most radar, we have up to a 10% blind range up here just because of the inability for the, from the antenna to be able to pick that up. Now, with the digital component of this and the increased software that we have, we've given, based on our ground speed, the average picture that you might see as you are approaching it. So we can see targets within that 10% range. So predictive lightning, we can see uh, that lightning there with the yellow and the hail uh, with the red shaded areas. And then the predictive wind shear alerting. So optimal for up to five miles and then potential with the yellow bars telling us there is potential wind shear there. That was the 70, 75, and 80 as far as the features are concerned. And so now we're going to go through a little bit of weather threat management. The primary process here is identifying a potential precipitation related threat, investigating those threats, and then assessing uh, the level of that threat and the need to react and what are we going to do about it. So identifying a threat could be any, anything that we see. That first example that we showed where it, it turned out to be a city, we identified that um, magenta target on the screen and then we investigated it by using tilt management to rule out the possibility of it being a storm cell. So we were doing it already. We want to we want to develop a consistent methodology for this. So identification of that precipitation based threat, we're going to develop a mental picture. So in order to develop a mental picture, I want to use as many resources that I have available to me. My eyes outside the cockpit, my eyes inside the cockpit with the airborne weather radar, and compare that to my strategic weather avoidance as well. So all of our ground-based pre-flight activities. We have our in-flight strategic weather avoidance with NEXRAD, whether that be through FISB, Garmin Connect, Sirius XM, or some other form. Our strategic weather avoidance with our airborne uh, radar with the long range settings. All right, so here's a little bit of quiz for you. What do we see? Give you a little bit more information. We're 40 miles southwest of Tampa. Now we put that on an overlay of a map and now we're starting to develop a really good mental picture. That did turn out to be land. And one reason that I was suspect to being at land at the very beginning is that I have a very strong return right there. And all of this red was after that strong return. If that was a storm cell, it definitely would have gotten some sort of attenuation, if not a complete shadow behind there. We have water right there. Uh, we are, we are uh, pointed at water out here. It's just not enough uh, turbulence in the water to be able to uh, rise up and kick back a reflection towards us. Typically, if you're above 12 to 15 knots, you might start getting some white caps on that water and start seeing those returns on your weather radar. All right, we have precipitation off the coast. Uh, I can see that there was, in fact, a shadow behind that, or at least no return. So that was either maybe an island or uh, something like that. It did turn out to be weather. I've compared it to my uh, XM Lightning, and it proved to be that weather. Continuing to ID uh, those potential precept threats. 
I have three different pictures there telling me all sorts of different information. I'm using all the tools around me to develop that mental picture to avoid those storms. I also have my turbulence detection, so white with the 75 and 80 and magenta with the 70. Target alert bands are telling me that there is a potential threat. It's time to go investigate. Range out, change your tilt, look at your next rat if it's available where you're at. If you have that weather alert uh, within 10 degrees of your heading, you're going to get that cast message. Weather attenuated color highlight, or if we are just getting any shadows behind, if we don't have that, if we did not have that weather attenuated color highlight, uh, still using shadows to be able to tell us, hey, I need to go investigate this. Tactical weather avoidance in comparison to and, and with you know, XM or ADSB with the next rad winds aloft lightning or echo tops. So that was a primary on the uh, identification. So you found that there is something that could be a storm or, or a weather threat. Now I'm going to go investigate it. Uh, for the purpose of time, we're just going to touch the key points. So use all of our available resources for the investigation phase. Tilt must be adjusted. So we have to manage that. We can't just keep it in one spot or something could creep up on us and surprise us. Uh, gain control can be adjusted. Uh, if you do use gain control, please, please, please return that to calibrated gain. Uh, otherwise, it could cause you to um, misjudge a storm cell and fly into something more severe than you were anticipating. Uh, ground clutter suppression can be used to remove most ground clutter. You know, it's a suppression, not elimination. Uh, adjust that tilt and range settings before activating. And my personal preference is to toggle that on and off uh, to see the comparison. Vertical mode can be used to assess the tops, but not for the purpose of overflying. Just gives us kind of an estimation, hey, is that more of a cell versus just ground returns? And we'll see a couple pictures of that later. Okay, weather avoidance and decision making. So we want to allow time, right? So we have to identify, investigate, and then assess. It does take time for us to do that. I do recommend you go use that during VMC conditions, right? In before you are in the weather. That way you can actually see what your city, what your area looks like without the, the weather threat there. Then you'll be able to know the difference. All right, so we're either gonna continue, deviate, and we're gonna do that 20 miles as the FAA recommends, and uh, or divert. Effective decision-making does require that time for us to be able to choose between those. So identify it, investigate it, and then assess what are we going to do. Develop that consistent methodology and use it in VMC prior to going into that weather. So key takeaways here, we have strategic weather avoidance and then we have tactical weather avoidance and we have our various tools uh, that we have to be able to investigate. All right, here is our quiz. Okay, we have a few examples. We're gonna give you a moment to see where is the storm, if any. So based on all the things we've talked about, we have ground returns and they are set to, uh, maybe I would like it a little bit less, I'd probably tilt up half a degree and see if that moves that ground returns out half a mile, but I have enough here to tell me where the weather is and most likely where the weather isn't. So I have my inner ground line right there and anything that's coming up inside the inner ground return, I have to uh, assume that is a potential threat and it calls for more investigation. That did, turn out to be precipitation. Okay, here's the next example. Where's the storm? So we have our inner ground line. I don't see a whole lot moving in from there, so I'm not concerned with anything really immediately within the next 60 miles. I have this huge set of uh, returns right there. You know, initial thought, without having the education that we have over the last uh, 50 minutes or so, I'd think maybe that's a squall line. We're going to come back to that. Here we have this uh, red return, and then we have this gap behind it with returns on either side of that. That tells me that it's most likely a shadow, and that was, in fact, the storm uh, or, or one of them. We have that shadow. So shadows aren't necessarily, you know, horrible. They are used for our interpretation of the imagery. 
we'd have Iowa City and Cedar Rapids. So without any information of where we were, we were able to pick out the precipitation because of the shadow, nothing inside. Uh, this did turn out to be Iowa City and Cedar Rapids. So those of you familiar with the Midwest, you might be clued into what's here on the left. That was I-35 with Des Moines, Ames, Fort Dodge, all along there. I didn't see any shadows back there. That was my big clue. Okay, where is the storm? Interground return line right there. We do have some things right there. There might be some precipitation. I do have these uh, scary colors over here and over here that I might want to be aware of. I'm not seeing much shadows there. Doesn't mean that it's not a cell. Could be a, la a large number of cells. There was that shadow behind here. Proved to be that there was that, that precipitation in the front. Precipitation in the front. More precipitation. We turn ground clutter suppression off here, or sorry, on here, and we can see sometimes with ground clutter suppression, it wasn't able to turn off all of this ground clutter, making it actually somewhat difficult to determine the two. That's why in this particular case, it was beneficial to me to turn it off and then turn it back on. All right, so we always recommend train as you fly, fly as you train. That's the point for practicing in VMC conditions. If you don't use it in VMC, you will not have a great reference for what ground returns compared to those weather returns look like. So now what? Uh, we're going to practice using that system uh, with tilt management and range selection. Uh, the phase of flight numbers here are kind of starting points. Uh, now, for, with your aircraft, with your radar, you would want to adjust it there to find out, hey, in cruise flight, where am I just going to start my, my tilt at and then work from there? So tilt and range. So uh, here's kind of some similar numbers based on phase of flight. We're going to tilt to, man to minimize ground clutter. Depending on your altitude and range, it's going to be on the outer third or possibly mid or, middle or inner third. So when you're practicing in VMC, what are you going to go look for? Uh, cities, how are they going to look? Bodies of water. We saw that if, the, if it's not strong winds, if it's calm, calm water, it could be just skipping and you're, it looks like a shadow. So here's a, another quiz for you. If you are flying from the west to the east into Chicago, that might look like the absolute most terrifying thing you've ever seen based on this uh, training that we've just gone over. You're going to see a large magenta cell with a shadow behind it. So for you to practice in VMC, see what that Chicago looks like from the west to the east with the shadow behind it. And if there's any variance to that in the, in the future, then you're going to have a much better understanding of what's going on. Get to know your flying routine. Uh, if you do fly near mountainous uh, terrain, see how that's going to appear prior to flying in the weather in the mountains. All right, so at the beginning, we said importance of practicing in VMC conditions. We just talked about that. Tilt management techniques, we have a lot of people over scanning, so tilting too high, and then the storm walks in and surprises them. So you managing that technique, typically starting low and working your way up to, to try to paint that cell. The next rad compared to the airborne weather radar, it's a complement of tool, okay? It's, but it's not a replacement. It will not, cannot look like the same thing. And then we've talked about some of the radar image interpretation techniques. So if you have any questions, please do submit those. Uh, and we will be shutting down the webinar in a few moments. If you don't get your questions answered, please email that uh, aviationtraining.garmin, uh, or sorry, sorry, aviationtraining.webinar at garmin.com. We appreciate you uh, paying attention today, and we hope you got a lot of useful tools. And have a good night. Paul, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, everyone who's um, been with us uh, for the presentation. A lot of great information. I know there are is a lot of information Paul gave and some information on the slides in particular that I'm sure many of you will want to go back and review. Uh, just a reminder, the entire presentation was recorded. It'll be posted uh, tomorrow and it'll be available on Sporty's YouTube channel and also in the Sporty's webinar archives at sporty's.com slash webinars.